I would be starting from the uh, the road safety, the you know, like very important issue in our country because people are dying on the road and you know, like um, the road are very unsafe and there are issues related to this. And I'll be starting from this as a first issue. And I'll be talking about traffic congestion related issues in our country. And, 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 and after that, I'll be talking about this air pollution and tail emissions and dust and smoke, you know, like uh, from this uh, transportation related systems and and and, and uh, at, the, at the end I would like to add this like how we can from Naples diaspora support on these issues to improve the situation there in our home country so that that will discuss it actually I don't have any proposal as of now but I would like to you know like um, hear from people here on this how we can support and what I have found is like these issues I have listed above are mainly issues related to design and delivery of the road and highway projects and issues related to transport planning and land use and policies that has, you know, like caused by those issues. And, and these issues are also like because of the reluctance of our authorities to use the latest technology and methods and findings in our country. And, and, and other thing is like gap on the existing institutional framework and policies that are also you know like causing these problems. And, and again, what I have found is like there is some issue with the stakeholder management and coordination. There is no certainty who is doing what kind of scenario. And, and that is the another issue and, and lack of the public awareness and enforcement. That is also you know like causing problems. So I'll be talking about around these points. And coming to the way forward, I am planning to give, I don't know how much, you know, like we have 722 now, and I'm planning to complete this presentation by around five o'clock. So we will see how much we can cover. So I'll try to talk about the short term solutions that are, you know, like related to design and development of these schemes and how we can, for example, how we can improve the road intersections to improve the capacity of the road network. And, and you know how we can improve the public transport system, more dedicated bus lanes, you know. And, and for example, how we can improve the active modes of transportation, like building, you know, like lots of sidewalks and pedestrian crossing and things. And also I'll try to give you some idea about the plan and develop the cycle lanes and safe system approach for the road safety. And if, if time permits, I'll talk about the road safety audit methods and, you know, the required institutional framework in, in, in context of the fall. And, and also I'd like to add about this traffic impact study and I'll give the brief introduction of that. What is that and why we should start doing this in Nepal? In terms of long-term solutions, I would try to toss the, you know, like moving towards the e-mobility and how we can reduce the carbon, you know, like uh, dioxide emission and things and how we can, you know, like support towards the net zero and things and uh, in long-term, solution i would also like to talk about this the provide and decide approach in the transport planning i will i'll come to this point later what is this and 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 like and also i like to touch about the supporting the decarbonization like utilizing the clean and you know like green energy uh, that is being used in the transport sector and similarly i'll try to uh, touch the brt and and metro rail system you know like what are the initiations are happening there in our country we'll discuss that as well in this slide i am trying to show the trend of vehicle growth in nepal you can see in nepal the total number of registered vehicles has increased by five times in last 10 years i'll not spend more than this time on this slide and in another trend you can see, for example, like not only the like federal government, even in the provincial governments, even the local governments, they are there is a kind of competition to purchase vehicles, you know. And you can see this kind of news in the newspapers uh, and in daily basis. And, and, and if you see the data, there is an increment of registered vehicles in Kathmandu is 35 times in the last 20 years. If you want to validate this data, we can go to the Ministry of you know, like Transport website and you can see there. So this is the huge increment in the last 20 years. And what is happening? You can see here, travel, average travel speed are as low as seven kilometers per hour during peak hours in Kathmandu, which is below the acceptable level of any, any capital city all around the world. And external cost to the economy due to this traffic congestions is around 1% of 
GDP. Actually, if you see in our context, there is no detailed study on conjunction pricing has carried out by anyone. I have not seen so far, but I, I, I found I have you know like calculated this data comparing this with the uh, like some you know like South Asian and other you know like Eastern Asian countries of the you know similar kind of conjunctions uh, that facing with, and I'm just comparing the scenario. I'm just just I'm just assuming this 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 external cost to the economy because of the traffic conjunction in Kathmandu especially because Kathmandu is the capital city and you know like most of the vehicle and things are concentrated there in, in it's it's due to that is around one percent of GDP. So again I'm trying to show this like uh, all the like government local government provincial government central government and in, in people all are like focusing towards going towards the private vehicle. If you see the human being by nature, like we want to utilize our, you know, like we want to maximize our utilities. We want to be, live better life, comfortable life. That is quite natural. But on the other hand, you know, a state should balance the system. This is my understanding. A state should balance the system by controlling and imposing the rule and regulation to, you know, like own the private vehicles in our country. Just think. What would happen if all people who can financially afford the private vehicle being cars on the road? So as of now, like if you see, if you see the data in Kathmandu, around three percent of population on private vehicle. So what will happen if all the people, like you know, like started bringing their vehicle in the road? So I think this is time to think towards mass transit. In this slide, so that was regarding in a conjunction. I was just trying to give the like, you know, uh, like a uh, gravity of the situation caused by the like a uh, conjunction. Here in this slide, I'm trying to give you the like uh, status of you know, like road safety. If you see the data based on like 2075, 2076 BS, like road fatalities were close to 3000 at that time. I think in last five years, it has reached in a cross already 3000. This is as per the traffic police data. This is this column is as per traffic police data, and this is as per the like WHO. So as per WHO, close to 5,000 people, which is around 3% of the total death in Nepal, are, are, are dying on the road. And if you see there, say senior serious injuries is close to 5,000. Serious injuries means people are, you know, like people are if people are getting sometimes of permanent disabilities. So you can imagine their life, how they are living as a surviving kind of situation. So if you see the total number number of accidents is it's it's around fifteen thousand per year, which is massive. So the situation is as of as of today, like around fifteen people do not return home at the evening for forever in Nepal because they are killed on the roads. Their loved one are waiting, and these people remember these people are comparatively these people are comparatively healthy. And going for some work outside, they are not seriously ill people. They are in their most of them. Now, if you see the like data, they are in the their most productive age, are dying on the road, are killed on the road, and they are not returning at home at the evening. And if you see the external cost to economy due to this premature death and disabilities, there is a huge burden in the public health system because of this, because you know government has to treat them. And, and if government is not directly treating them, if people are treating themselves, but there is an ultimate burden in the system anyway. So if you see this cost, again, in our context, there is no any clear study on this, but I assume it is around 1% of GDP is going there. And this is about like financial things only. If you see the long-term effects of the families due to the health and disabilities of the breadwinner, it's massive. You know, they are they are like, you know, like suffering like anything for entire life. Their children, their wife and other dependents are, you know, like suffering like anything. So this is the scenario. And, and this all data is as per WSO close global status report of 2018. If you are interested and if you want to more know, know more about it, you can go to this status report and, and you can find, you know, the current status in Nepal. In, in this Slide. I'm trying to give you the like how how bad you know uh, the year is in, in in Kathmandu. To be honest, if you see here, you know, as the, in this weekend, I was trying to prepare this slide. I was just taking the condition of year in you know like 
Kathmandu in this IQ year website. And what I found is for the December 1st Friday, you know, day before yesterday is unhealthy for sensitive groups with this EQI, 111 EQI. And Saturday, yesterday, it was again in the same close to that value. And if you see there, like the, the, the finest particle concentration in Kathmandu, if you see in the DOS and you know, like it's smoke there, it's 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 around 4.2 times more than the WHO quality guidelines value. So what is happening? Every day we are breathing very polluted air, kind of poison in Kathmandu. On the other hand, there are you know, lots of vehicles, people are buying vehicles, there is no control on the government, even government is you know, like promoting to buy vehicles, but, but this is the scenario. In, in our contest, again, I was trying to find the data, what is the burden on the public health system to this air pollution uh, related, you know, like diseases, but I could not find the exact data. I think it has to be quantified, some studies needed, I'd like to recommend that, you know. And, and 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 but but in my understanding, you know, like when when we are when we are you know like inhaling this kind of air every day, and you know, this this uh, dead you know like impact of this air pollution and and, and deadly diseases related to that is massive. So this is again, you know, this is the this is the scenario. The irony is, you know, I was just adding this slide just you know, now. The irony is, despite the huge trade deficit with India associated with vehicle import and other external costs to the economy due to traffic congestion and road safety, I would add this: if you see the cost of vehicle, in, as of today, I think if you see the you know like data as of today, the trade deficit with India is around one thousand two hundred billion. And if you see there, you know, like if you see the breakdown there, the, the component of the vehicle import, vehicle imports, all the, you know, like mostly 80% vehicles are coming from India. Their spare parts are coming from India. Petroleum product to run those fuels, everything is coming from India. And this trade deficit is, is keep on increasing. And if you see the external cost to the economy, due to the, this traffic congestion and road safety, this is close to already, you know, like two to 3% if you like sum it up. So despite all this problem, if you see the policy of our Ministry of Finance is always promoting to own and bring the private vehicle because they are imposing around 200 and 250% tax and, and government is considering that tax as an income to run the, you know, like daily expenditures. So this is the irony. So I think, I think like this is the challenge, you know, like to educate people, to you know, like spread the awareness of this, and and you know, like look for the solution. So, so these are the problems. I was sharing only problems so far. So, what could be the way forward? How we can improve this situation? But as a diaspora, how we can support, you know, like our government bodies and our people there to come out of this situation? I'm just going to share some of the, you know, like idea that develop uh, while preparing this slide. First of all, I like to recommend to, you know, like um, as a short term solution, I would strongly recommend to improve the capacity of road intersection by design. What is happening if you see this transportation model, one, one, one model of the city? What will happen is like this network capacity is governed by intersection capacity, not by the link capacity, because link are anyway, vehicle are moving there. But what will happen in the intersections? Vehicle coming from all the all the sides should share this small space. If you see in this Guarco intersection, for example, this space has to be shared by all the vehicles coming from all sides. If you see this Chabil intersections, vehicles should share this space here. So when we when all the vehicles from coming from all the direction has to share one space available there. We need to design this, you know, like thoughtfully. So if you see here in this diagram, I'm I'm just trying to share the like, you know, like one proper uh, signalized intersections. So if you see there, if you see the proper design, you know, this typical four leg intersection, I'm choosing to just, you know, like give you the idea. If you see here, we have this, you know, like this storage lane for the vehicle turning this side. You can see this acceleration lane for the vehicle turning this side. Similarly, you can see the storage lane here for the vehicle turning this side. Again, you can see this two throw lane for the vehicle going, you know, like a straight. Here you can see the lanes going straight here. So like this, like, you know, there are lots of geometrical parameters we need to fix and we need to design this properly. But what is happening in our country? 
like these intersections are very neglected. Like for example, if you see our Guarco intersections, this Chinese government invested huge money to build the this part of the ring road from Kotesha to Kalanki. And they said, you oh, know, we have completed this project. And they have made this all road, you know, like eight lanes. If you go there in Kathmandu and travel, you can see a very nice road there. But what is happening? Coming to the intersection, you will see this. They are not improving intersection at all. You cannot see any channelizing, any like different, you know, like uh, channels, signalizing them, you know, like uh, fixing the geometry properly and this, this thing are not happening in our company, in our country. Similarly, this is stable intersection. It's just a big R, you know, without any channelization and anything. So these things, what I would like to recommend is, first of all, if we want to improve the like capacity of our like transportation network and system, like our government agencies, our government bodies should focus to improve the road intersections because none of the, as of today, none of the intersections are like properly signalized in our country, unfortunately. So I, I took this one picture from this Biratnagar Itari, you know, like one of the engineer from DOR was posting this in the like Facebook and I saw this. And, and, and what, this is the newly newly built road in a very nice road, and you know, like they are spending lots of money there. But what is happening when this vehicle, when this road is intersecting here, when this vehicle, for example, this heavy, heavy, you know, like tailor is coming here and is trying to take a turn here, you know, and it, it is crossing all three lanes. It is not signalized. People are coming at a very high speed. People are, you know, coming on the bike. They're like flying, you know, like if you see this geometry of this road, it is provoking the high speed driving. And people are coming like this. And at the same time, this big truck is, you know, like turning, like without any, you know, measures and things. So what is happening? These, 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 these problems on the geometry of the intersection, this improper design, improper layout is contributing those road fatalities that I was showing you. This is contributing on those severe, you know, like injuries. This is contributing on the like traffic conjunction that you can see here because they are creating bottleneck. And, and because of this issue, what is happening? If you go to in Kathmandu in, you know, like peak hour, travel speeds are as low as seven kilometer per hour. So this is my, you know, like very, very first recommendation. And if people are, I just want to toss this, people are talking about building flyovers, but what I am saying is, do we really need the free flow and access control in the system? Have we checked all the signal? Have we signalized our, you know, at great intersections? Have we designed them properly and checked them? Because flyovers are very expensive, you know? So, so if we need them really, if you want free flow in the system, if we want access control in the system, yes, it is good to go for the flyover. If we are building the, like, in a huge expressway and we want to just, you know, like, it is that free flow throughout the land. Yes, it makes sense for going for the flyovers. Otherwise, you know, for example, in ring roads, in case of Kathmandu, we have built up area all sides and there are pedestrians, there are cyclists, there are other vehicles. So we cannot achieve free, free flow in any case. So in that case, is it good to go for the flyovers? Did you check all the ad grade options and they are existed and not working anymore? So these are the like questions I think, you know, like authorities and government should look into because, you know, like, we have limited budget. We are from the poor country. Our country is not very rich, so we have limited in our resources. So, so I think we need to, you know, like spend any every every, you know, like training very, you know, like wisely. So that would be my suggestion. So here another way forward. I'm just uh, considering as a, like promoting sustainable mode of transportation, discouraging private vehicle ownership, and you know, like um, create the more active modes of transportation and promote them. So if you see in Kathmandu, like uh, I was going through one paper when I was preparing this slide and, and what I found is like most of the people in Kathmandu and average of less than five kilometers in a day. So we need to think what type of, I, you know, like infrastructure would be ideal for this kind of, you know, like um, transportation. So we are, see Kathmandu is not a big city. I'll show you in this slide actually, I have another slide for this. This is Kalanki here. I have this mark here, red mark you can see here. And this is Kapangumba. And this is the boundary of, you know, like Kathmandu municip municipality. And this is the like another extreme edge of the Kathmandu. And this is like Kalanki. So this is 10 kilometer. So there is somewhere here at the park here. So hardly if you see the like uh, trips people are making, they are normally less than five kilometer. Again, to be honest, there is no clear study to, you know, like, um, like confidently say this, 
was based on our, you know, like land use pattern and, you know, like kind of businesses and house they have and the size of the city. We can say this is much smaller than Delhi, for example. It is much smaller than it is London or Mumbai. It's not a very big city. It's not in a catching so much of population. So, so we can say per trip is around, you know, less than five kilometers in case of Kathmandu. So what is happening? Like I found on this uh, paper, like from this Dr. Partha Parajuli, and, and he is in this paper, he is advocating for, you know, like sustainable mode of transportation and he is very specific on this 3B policy for the Kathmandu Valley. What he's trying to say in this paper is 3B means for the boot, bike and bus. What he is arguing is like, we can't completely, you know, like, uh, like uh, go for this kind of model here because at the origin people can walk for a couple of minutes five six minutes and they'll catch the bus and they'll, they'll get down at the destination and they'll walk for another couple of meters or maximum five meter five minutes and, and that kind of model and again you know like building the more cycle lanes and things so that people can go there right bicycle and, and you know you can people can use that as a you know like um, more of the transport if, if people are like um, Doing that in, for example, in Tokyo, in 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 Copenhagen, even in London, even in you know, like I live in Cambridge, or even Cambridge, we can see lots of you know, like cyclists. And these countries having you know more than fifty, you know, like fifty fifty five thousand um, dollar per capita. These companies are this in, in people in these countries are using bicycle. Why can't we do in Kathmandu? If you see the weather and other things, is you know, like very favorable for the cycling there. So this is the argument he's putting. I, I fully support this, and that's the reason I wanted to show this in this slide. So again, this is dedicated wasteland. Currently, there is an issue going on, like uh, government has started dedicated wasteland from Bhaktapur to like um, Ratta Park, and there are some issues. Again, they you know like um, pause this, and again they have started resume this, and there are some issues going on. I think this one one and picture is more than enough to show the importance of you know like mass transit and importance of you know like dedicated bus routes in the in in, in case of Kathmandu especially. So I think I don't need to speak much about this. So we can see that, you know, like people carrying capacity. Definitely when you travel in car, it will be very comfortable. But the issue is government has to see, like, can we afford this? So this is very important. So as an individual, yes, people want to prepare car. I want to prepare car. I want to, you know, like carry my kids and wife and family and other things in the car. Nice car, beautiful, you know, like fast car. But the issue is government has to, you know, like impose rule and regulation. Government has to think the future of city, not the individuals. So this one, I'm just trying to give you the idea. There are, you know, like if you see in Nepal road is standard, and they are also, this is about like improving the you know, sidewalk and things. As per the WHO road fatalities data of 2016, around 5,000, you know, out of these 5,000 death fatalities, around 30 to 35, 5% are pedestrian. So pedestrian, are, they are not using any vehicle. They are just walking on the road. You know, they are just very innocent road users are being killed on the road because some vehicles, some car and things are coming and hitting them. So how we can make them safe? In you know, research shows if we have, if we have nice infrastructure, for example, nice crossings and, you know, like, um, sidewalks, people will come and walk. I'll give you my own example. I When I go in Kathmandu, like I live near to Sukedara, and there is a Bhatbatani in Chakrapath, and it's around three kilometers. I would love to walk this distance, but I cannot do that because there are no sidewalks. So what I mean is, if we have, you know, nice, this kind of infrastructure, definitely people would, you know, like prefer to walk for the sort of trip, and, and there will have you know, lots of other benefits because of that. So again, this uh, slide, I'm just trying to show how we you know like can pedestrian, what kind of consideration we need to have for the pedestrian when you are you know like designing road. And quickly, I'll just tell you about this graph. If if vehicle is hitting pedestrian at 30 km per hour speed, the chances of dying is around like uh, 0.1%, not even 10%, you know. In, 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 in the vehicle of around, you know, like 60, 65 and so close to 70 kilometer per hour speed is hitting the pedestrian, like chances of surviving is around 5%. So, you know, like this, this way you can see this thing is exponentially going up, but this is the speed of the, you know, like 
uh, vehicles hitting the pedestrian. So what I'm trying to say is to make pedestrians safe, we need to control speed. Either we have to separate the motorized vehicles and pedestrian by time or space, time by push button or like signal and things, or space by you know, like underpass or overpass. Otherwise, if you are mixing with 80 km per hour speed and pedestrian walking there, definitely will see the result that I have shown there in my previous slide. And, and this is what happening in our country. So these are the other, you know, like um, uh, geometrical parameters and things we normally consider while designing the pedestrian facility in the, you know, like urban environment. I'm not going in detail on this. So this another thing I'd like to share here again. This is the newly built road somewhere in the eastern Nepal. I recently you know, got this picture. In, in what is happening? If you see here, there is a zebra crossing. And, and authorities are saying, okay, we have provided zebra here. But if you see the data, this false sense of safety at zebra crossing, especially in the developing countries, are killing more pedestrians than not, you know, like having any zebra. So it's better to not to paint any zebra without safety consideration. That would be my recommendation. So people will think, okay, it's zebra crossing. You know, when pedestrian is crossing, they'll just you know like completely walk. But what is happening? The people who are driving there, they don't give way to that. So there are issues related to enforcement. This is different. And again, you know, like enforcement has to be supported by engineering. I'll come to this point because we cannot make a road like this and, you know, like three lane and three lane wide road. And we are asking pedestrians to cross this and vehicle are flying there and people are dying. So this is, again, I'll not spend much time on this. This is the normally pedestrian consideration in the, in the global practice, how we are providing this provision for the pedestrian, how they can cross, you know, kind of things. I just wanted to share here. Now, my another recommendation would be like developing cycle related infrastructure. Again, while preparing this slide, I was going through some resource paper and I found this interesting one by Dr. Taral Al Sresta and, and he's doing, you know, like he's a lecturer in Tribune University and he's doing research related to this. He's very interested on this actually. I had a call with him on this. And what he has been saying is cycling in Nepal is going to be more risky in absence of cycle infrastructure. So if you see here, like I'll I'll tell you here, this is newly built ring road. We have we can you can count here. We have four lanes for the main roads here. We have two lanes service stored here, two lanes service stored here. While we are building such a wide road with eight lanes, we are not considering any cycle lane. So this is the problem. So how how we can expect cyclists to mix with this traffic and you know right safely? So what is happening, they will discourage to come on the road with a cycle. When I came here in Cambridge, first thing I did is I buy a bicycle. But I cannot do that in Kathmandu because it's unsafe there. So this is the human psychology. So if we have infrastructure, people will come. So like that, just rich countries are focusing on cycle lines. But why in our country? So this is the question. Like, for it's, it's maybe our VIP culture to blame, or you know, like because of people making policy to not ride bicycle. There was a you know like interesting um, event. I was attending one conference, and there was a like you know former um, DZ from Department of Road, and he was delivering this. And I was asking, sir, like, um, and I was asking this question about the bush. Cycle lanes. And he was saying, like, FMG, cycle ko chartara, kind of a statement. So, what I am thinking is, like, the people who are in policy, so they cannot foresee the need. But the people in the grassroots level, like, who are like uh, using bicycle for their daily commute, can see the need. So what I assume is there is lack of awareness among, among policymakers. So that is, you know, like people don't want to invest on cycle related infrastructure. So just think, this slide I just, you know, like is the same picture previously used. Just think if we had five meter wide, wide cycle in here 
and another five meter wide cycle in here. How many people would be coming on the bicycle? And what would be the benefit for the city, for the individuals? There are lots of health benefits. We all know that. And for the you know like future of the city. So I think we need to, as a diaspora, as a, you know, like people working outside and seeing different things and, you know, like manage differently outside, I think we need to advocate for this. And I'd like to request all of you to think it seriously and advocate wherever you can to make these things happen. So there are a number of benefits from cycling, so cycling and walking. You know, I, I took this slide from the Department for Transport, of, you know, uh, from United Kingdom, uh, Department for Transport uh, 2018 data. There are a number of health benefits because of, you know, like cycling and, and walking. So I don't want to go in, you know, like, um, it's, I don't want to explain the each one here, but, you know, like, there are number of number of benefits by cycling and walking. Not only for the like to make our cities clean and green, just to make our you know make ourselves healthy and fit. So I would share this slide if you are interested. You can go and see these figures. So I would also like to add, you know, uh, like this cut onto metro rail and the long term solutions and people are talking about this and look, okay, we need metro. Yes, we need metro. Having metro is very good. If London can have metro 100 years back, why can't we have? Now? But we need to see the challenges in our contest. So I'm just trying to give you the idea, like, you know, like recently constructed metro rails in Asia, in you know, South Asia and East Asia, especially I'm trying to be close to Kathmandu to just to compare the figures. Uh, like, and you can see here, uh, Jakarta North South lane, 15 kilometer per kilometer cost was $70 million. Delhi Metro, the first line I'm taking is 8.335 million. First line, it was completed in 2002, before I joined IIT Delhi for my master degree. In Dhaka Metro, they are really struggling. Per kilometer cost is coming 153 million. They are struggling like anything to complete this. It is started, it is yet to be completed. Again, I found this in, uh, interesting one, this Patna Metro in Bihar, close to uh, Kathmandu. It's, it's 53.4 million. They have just started. I don't know what will be the variation cost at the end of this project. But this is the estimated cost. So my argument would be, it's, it's good to have, definitely. But but can we design, build, and operate with our current capability? This is the question I think we need to ask ourselves. And you know, we all know what are the challenges and opportunities of the Kathmandu Metro. And and I think I think our government, yes, it is good to have after 15 years, after 20 years, it's good to have metro in Kathmandu. But the thing is, with our institutional capacity, like, can we do this? Or how we have to, you know, like in which direction we have to build our capacity. I think these are the points our authorities would mine it to work on and prepare it. So I'm just interested to show this some initiations happening in Kathmandu Metro of Maybe you have already seen this. This is taking from, I have taken this slide from the Kathmandu Post, uh, Binod, engineer Binod Lal Ahmad there. He is working in Atkins, UK. We are in the same company now. Actually, I have taken from, you know, like one of his article from Kathmandu Post. And, and he, he is, he is, I have seen his, you know, like articles in Kathmandu Post since Kathmandu Post and even in other, you know, like um, newspapers. Uh, since last uh, eight, nine years, he has been actively advocating for yeah, this uh, metro rail. And there is a link here. I'll share this slide. You can go through this and you can have, you know, like have a look on the detail. So he is, you know, like uh, even giving the concept layout and things and connectivity and links. And, and this is the some initiation by the invest, investment board Nepal. They have also identified some length, routes, and you know, like it's this elevated underground and things. And they are showing, okay, we'll go for the beauty basis, build up and transfer. And they are looking for the investor. And and, and as, as I mentioned previously, we have so many stakeholders, and they all are going their own way, kind of, you know, like who is responsible for what. There are kind of confusion. I think this is also very important in our con contest to you know, like uh, focused on you know, like one thing. So this is also, you know, like initiated by the Invested Board Nepal. I'm not sure whether these routes and length are matching with the previous slide that I have 
you know, this slide, I'm not sure of that. I didn't validate this, but yeah, there are some initiations on Metro as well. Again, coming to the e-mobility. So e-vehicles, one of the, you know, like hot topic nowadays everywhere. So I was just thinking, what are the pros and cons of this e-mobility? And what I found is utilization of the huge hydropower potential in our country, I think it's good. This is one of the, you know, like cons. Uh, it's benefits of having this and, and definitely when you go for like um, e-mobility our cities will be clean there will be the no tailpipe emission you know like these are very positive things and we can you know like drastically reduce the air pollution related disease and other burden to the public health so and other thing is the reduce the trade deficit with india associated with the petroleum products Again, there is a huge trade deficit with India, which is increasing day by day. So again, that will help you if you go for this immobility and electric vehicles. But what I have found is this electric vehicle don't help on traffic management. The congestion will be there, even if we go for EV. So money go down, goes out while importing EVs increase that. In, there, there it will have because normally these EVs are coming from China. Instead of India, the money start going towards China. So we need to think carefully. Again, you know, this is another challenging th thing. This replacing and disposing this battery, lithium ion batteries. So this is another, you know, like challenge. What will be the carbon footprint of those batteries? And, and, and again, you know, like EV don't support to reduce the road crashes. So these are the pros and cons of the EV. Definitely it's better to go on EV with if you compare with the, like you know petroleum fuels and other things. But but like there are lots of like a disadvantage too I need to think about. This slide I think we are at five o'clock. It will take another 15 20 minutes. Is that okay to everyone? Yes, yes, Premzi. Yeah, that's fine. Ah, okay, thank you. So this uh, coming to this uh, way forward on the road safety, what is happening? Like if you see in our contest, uh, like uh, if you see the investigation of all accidents, 90% road crashes and, and the traffic police is giving data, 90% saying like 90% road crashes are due to driver's negligence. So what is happening? Like nobody want to die by choice, you know. I am going on the road and I am driving on the road. Do I want to die there? No. So what is happening? The man-made system. We have road. We have vehicles. We have system. Somebody has designed road. Somebody is fixing the, you know, like enforcement things and speed limit and things. And because of this man-made all system, people are dying there. So what I think is we need to work on this underlying issues to make our road safe. So this one, I got it from internet and I found it in a most, it makes sense to me. So I thought like sharing with you here. So this is the holistic approach. We need to, we need to work on all the components, all the system man, component of the man-made system to make our road safe. So for example, safer is speed. We need to de decide the safer is speed and we need to like fix the appropriate, you know, like uh, uh, enforcement and fines and things like in a developed country, you know, like we need to have a proper data keeping and data, uh, you know, recording and data keeping system. And, and we need to develop the safer people, like, you know, like a, um, controlling on the, like, you know, um, driving schools, for example, controlling on the bus driver. And now there's lots of, the, you know, like casualties are happening because of this deeper truck drivers. So government can control there and then government can control on the, like, um, educate people, go for the awareness program on how to cross the road and how to make it the safe, you know, like, um, enhance the safety and things and again safer roads we can you know like um, we can bring lots of things while designing safety in design there is a component we follow this while designing road in the developed countries so similarly we can you know like choose the design parameters we can choose the you know like symmetrical parameter and things to make the road safer similarly for the safer vehicles like you know we can develop the system of annual in inspection for example uh, you know, like whether um, the vehicle is in good condition or not, we can say, for example, we can discard all the 30 years old vehicle, we can make the vehicle and save kind of things we can do. But all these things, 
you know, like all these things that I'm showing on the safe system approach has to be supported by road safety management. Yeah, there should be one institute to manage all this. To be honest, as in today, there is there is no like one institute like this to you know look into all these things. So what we have been saying is we need to have one institute to look into all these element and work on them. So this should be supported by the road safety management and again post crash response. If in case something happens, we should be like immediately we should be able to bring you know like treat the casualty, bring them to hospital, and we need that kind of infrastructure. So then only you can reduce this state. And as we all know, in developed countries, people are so focused on these safety related issues. People are investing lots of money to save life. So I think, again, from diaspora, we can do our best to educate people, share the knowledge and the skills that we are, you know, like gaining outside while working in the, you know, like developed countries and, 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 and for the, to save life there. This slide, I'm not going in detail. I'll share this slide. And if you are interested, you can go through this for the same component, like safe road users, safe vehicles, safe roads, safer speed. Like what should what is the definition of this? What should be the state's responsibility on this? What government should do this? What local government should do this? What they can do to this? I'm listing in all this and this column here. And again, coming to the citizens' responsibilities, like we also, you know, as a citizen, we all have uh, a responsibility. We all have like you know some sort of uh, responsibility to you know like contribute toward the road safety. For example, government cannot monitor our every moments. We should be mindful while driving, walking, crossing the road. Kind of you know we should not use mobile phone. We should not drink and driving. So. So, so these things I'm listing here. And here, this is very important. Yeah, what is the state's responsibility? What, what government can do to reduce the, you know, like these road accidents? What government can do to reduce the, this, you know, use external cost to economy? So they can, government of Nepal can work on these components. So I'm not going in, it's, you know, like um, one by one here. I think we don't have time. So again, that's, that, sorry. Again, that has to be supported by this road safety management system and post crash response. In, in road safety management, what I'm trying to say is establish the National Road Safety Council to coordinate, manage, regulate, support, facilitate the various stakeholder and road safety related activities across the country. We need one body to look after all this. So uh, I'm just going to next slide. I will say this slide and if you are interested, you can go in detail. Again, another way forward, like we are in Nepal, we are hesitating to use the proven, you know, like uh, methods and steps and things in our contest. So for example, road safety audit. So there are the clear procedure, how to conduct the road safety audit, how we can do that, how, how we can reduce the, you know, like how we can make the road safe from the concept level, preliminary level in the detailed design stage and kind of, there are you know, very clear procedure and things and like, but we are hesitating to use that. We don't have, you know, like proper institutional framework for that. So that would be my recommendation. Our government of Nepal should, you know, like form this, you know, institutional framework to carry these things. So similar to this traffic impact study. What I'm trying to show is this picture is I'm showing from the southern edge of Delhi. It was like this and it become like this. And while, while conducting traffic impact study, I'll give you an example. For example, like Bhadbhatini supermarket want to establish one Bhadbhatini somewhere in Balaju. So we should have system to check and balance and see what will be the impact of that bad botany. Or for example, on private engineering college, suppose, you know, like some private agency want to establish an engineering college somewhere in Kathmandu. So what is the impact of that, you know, like cheap generation, vehicle mobility because of that development in the existing network that has to be checked. 
So this system is not there in our country. So what is happening? We don't have data and you know, like kind of we have lost kind of scenario. So again, coming to this point, what I'm trying to say is uh, like there is um, like one manual called higher capacity manual. And normally while we are conducting this traffic impact study, we see the capacity of the highway when we take that. But in case of urban road, what I'm trying to say is we need to see there is another approach called provide and decide approach. If you are interested, you can Google this terminology. You can see what is this. You can say provide and decide approach in transportation management. First, in urban environment, we need to see how we want to build our street, how we want to build our community. So if you go as per the conventional high capacity manual traffic study, you will, you, it will, you know, like if this much demand is increasing, you know, like this is basically demand based. Like traffic demand is in, increasing means make the road wide, kind of result we'll get. But when we are working in the urban area, we need to decide first what we need here. That's what this provide and decide approach said. So we need to see how we want to see our like, you know, like cities, our street. So for example, like Chardani Chok was like this and it's become like this fully pedestrianized. If you go in Chardani Chok today, you will see fully pedestrianized area. Where are all these vehicles gone? So we need to see how we want to, you know, like see our cities. Definitely there is connectivity in the Chardani Chok. There is a mass transit there somewhere there are bus stops and people are getting down there and going to the southern Chok and we are walking on this nice piece of beautiful street whereas it was you know such a crowded pathetic situation previously so in Kathmandu we need to see in you know like this way how you know like we want to see our city our street in future our community in future So again, this is how to improve this intersection. I will skip this slide here. I will quickly tell you this. Yeah, I just spent two minutes on this. This is Kalanki intersection. This is newly constructed one, and this is the new. Uh, this is the ring road here. It is all underpass. It is going there. What happened is, you know, even now. If, now, if you go there, like you know, there is a small traffic beat, and that is trying to control the traffic flow, which is coming on the you know, ad grade. But I mean, Chinese government, they build the underpass, which is nice. It is working fine. They, you know, they, they, they construct, they, they invest lots of money. They construct the you know, retaining wall and these, like all civil and structural things they have done. And this underpass is working fine. But the issue is, after spending billion of rupees, there is still traffic bid. We are hesitating to signalize this intersection. And this one traffic policy is trying to control more than 50 conflict points there. If you count there, like there will be more than 50 conflict points. And, 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 and you know, so what I have been saying is like while designing roads, we should think in such a way that this engineering should support the enforcement. Otherwise, we, you know, like we'll have very haphazard situation and we cannot control and traffic police are struggling to do that. And, and, and it's not happening and, and we have seen the result like you know like the traffic conjunctions and things and, and if you see if you see the cost if you compare the cost the signalizing this column key intersect cost of the signalizing this color key intersection is around one percent of the total civil and structural work like government of nepal in the, invested to you know like build this underpass but why there is hesitation to invest another you know one percent to and signalize this properly and parallelly educate people. Yes, this is very important. We need to you know, spread the awareness among the road users. I'm, I'm just skipping all this here. This is interesting. We counted the conflict points here and we found around 56 conflict point on this four leg on signalized intersection. And we are giving responsibility for a couple of, you know, like two, three police, uh, traffic police to control the whole thing. They are not superheroes. And again here, same same thing here. So here I have some recommendation. I'll take another five minutes. I have some recommendation for the Nepalese countries. I have listed here. Mm, first of all, I think uh, our inner department of road or say Kathmandu municipality, if you talk about the you know, like local government, they need to strengthen the design unit within their you know, like department. If we cannot 
if we cannot design things properly, you know, we cannot build proper infrastructure. First, we need to see design, proper design. Yes, it is working fine kind of design. So what is happening? We don't have any design department. We are giving to some consultant. Even there is no control over that, you know. So they are just passing this to uh, go, um, consultant and they are you know, like preparing some drawings and things and they are bringing in and, you know, like, um, and nobody is taking this is the scenario there. I'll, I'll give you one small example. I was there in Nepal during this dashing, and one engineer who is working on this fast track project, he called me and he was asking me, Premji, can you recommend some design software for this fast track project? So we have lots of issues on, you know, like um, kind of coordination issues, and this label related issues, culvert labels, spray label, tunnel labels are not matching with the road labels and things. So we want some software to, you know, like um, bring all the designs and, you know, like prepare the integrated model. So if you see the cost of this project, I was just checking this morning, you know, like if for this presentation, the fast track uh, estimated amount is uh, I think uh, 212 billion Nepalese rupees. So it is two karva Nepali rupees. So when we are spending around two, 200 billion Nepali rupees, it's, it's a very huge money, it's very big money in any currency, we all know that. There is no proper design software. There is no proper design you need to control this. You know, we all know like how we work here. We we bring with all the design in the one in you know, a integrated model in the beam. We check there everything. We check the classes and things. Everything. Once we have a perfect model, and we will you know like prepare the drawing and, and issue for the construction. We all know that how we are doing. But there, like such a big project, people used to say, "No, it's a Nepal. It's a poor country. You cannot afford this software kind of things." But we are affording such a big, huge, expensive project, which variation is going in you know, more than ten times. If you if you if you are following the news there, but but we don't have you know like money to you know like buy proper software and things, so this is the scenario. So I was just giving my advice: go for the civil 3D. You can you know like um, uh, have all the designs there. You can coordinate with the drainage and things and things in a kind of. And I was just telling him how to purchase this and things. And on the other hand, you know DPR is already done, and 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 Nepalese army is saying okay, around 25 percent construction is completed there. And, and you know, but on the other hand, there is no you know like proper moral and design, and people are going to start the design. So this is going to be the another melange, in my opinion. I hope I'll be wrong. Yeah. So here, uh, so again, I think I'll not go one by one. I will share this slide. Please have a look. Due to the you know, we have already five fifteen. I'll not go in all these details. So there are some recommendations that government of Nepal can think about it and you know work on this. So my last slide is how can we from Nepalese diaspora support this? So with this question, I am like concluding my presentation. Thank you very much. So I'm I am I am leaving this question for you know like this question. I'm just taking my screen out. Thank you very much for hearing me. Over to you, please. Yeah, uh, Primzi. First of all, you know this is so wow. You know, uh, it's simply a quite a wonderful presentation. I just want to thank you very much for coming today. You know to share this information. And this is why these webinars are so awesome. You know, the information that you shared is so significant. As you summarize all the problems and solutions, everything so concisely, right? With so much supporting data and, and, and your valuable research, you know, it's all being put there, you know, that for us to see. So thank you very much for, for your time and effort. And uh, the, regarding that, you know, the false sense of safety is one thing that I really concur with, you know, especially in the context of Nepal. If you, if you consider the roads in Nepal, and that is one of the causes of accidents, right? That many of us have taken it for granted, you know, that false sense of 
safety and security, you know, especially in Nepal, you know, the, like the zebra crossing that you mentioned is, you know, people think like, oh, it would be safe in crossing, right? And then, and then you know, that's what's killing most of the people. You know, I've seen also myself, you know, in the roads of Nepal. And on one of the slides, you know, you mentioned that the possibility of this metro, you know, in mitigating, mitigating the traffic and transportation challenges, right? Currently plaguing Nepal. But as you know, we are in this active seismic zone, right? Do you think it's still feasible in the context of Nepal? You know, I mean, I always have that kind of you know, question in my mind, right? I mean, in, it's, it's already there in a lot of seismic zone places, like, you know, San Francisco, I think there is one. And then in Japan, we're also, right? Which, but we are not there yet, right? So, so do you think it's still, you know, feasible in the context of Nepal, this metro? I think mm, I think it is um, so technically yes it's feasible we can do it we can see this kind of infrastructure even in you know, like a um, very difficult situation but what I think is the, um, the, the the capability within the government bodies so I doubt on that and even financially you know like investment board started you know like uh, looking for the um, investment, they are working on that part. And I have seen they are working very hard there. And maybe they can find some companies in BOT basis and they can, you know, like go for it. And people would be, you know, like happy to invest on that. This, But what I have seen is like the capability within our, you know, like government institutes. So if we want to have this Metro rail, we need to, you know, like build our capacity immensely. And, and you might have heard about the Delhi Metro. What happened is I forgot his name, one of the engineer, who, you know. When uh, Srila Dixit, uh, chief minister of that time in Delhi, she was uh, like uh, bringing that concept, okay, Delhi need Metro project, and, you know. And, and one engineer from railway department, he was saying, no, I cannot do this within this existing bureaucracy and existing political, you know, like, situation but if you make one autonomous institute where i can work independently without any you know like um, influence i can deliver this project and, and give me some time give me six months i'll do proper research and i'll i'll give you my proposal how i can deliver this and you know sila this is trusted him you can Google this information, you know, like I forgot his name actually. I see Dharan or something, yeah. In 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 Sila Dichit trusted him. And, and and he did this. He gave her like him like six month time and, and he did proper research. He, you know, bring this proposal in the you know, like chief minister table and she agreed on that. And then Limiter was executed. Is executed. There are still extensions going on as a like independent uh, institute. It's looking after the whole thing. So it is possible if there is a commitment and will part from the political parties and you know like existing government departments. So that would be my answer. Mm. But you know, like you mentioned in Guarco intersection and all that, right? Chinese government spent so much billion, millions of billions of rupees there, you know, probably. And uh, you know, they built all those infrastructures. But you know, we still do not feel feel safe, you know. And especially in the in, in our context, you know, where you know we have made it, but you know, we don't feel ourselves comfortable in, in utilizing those, you know, <laughs> infrastructures. So, so on the roads, and you can see, you know, still fatalities are happening, right? But, but with metro, you know, I mean, I, I would not trust. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like we can do this. See, technology is advancing like anything, you know, and we can purchase things. We can purchase, yeah, I mean, you know, like um, uh, capable people. We can hire consultant and things, and you know. Like uh, we can do that, but the thing is, unless we have our own bodies who is controlling that. See, I was working in Qatar for quite a long time. I was there for last uh, not like eight years, I think, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, I know him like previously. It, and I have seen there, you know, government is so strong there. There are lots of international consultants are working there, but, but there are people in government, they are controlling those consultants like anything. I was working with a student consultant when I was there. And, and, and the questions government people are asking, the argument they are bringing, and, you know, like, was, was, like, was such a, you know, like, logical things they are doing, and they are, like, controlling like anything, all the consultant contractors and things. That's the reason they're able to, you know, like this, but this FIFA all government, all the infrastructure in the period. 
So that kind of that kind of institutional development we need in our context. So what is happening in Nepal? What I have seen is like if somebody is coming from ADB, our government is accepting all the terms and conditions, everything like kind of you know without arguing, without questioning anything. For example, if you see this cortesto to Kalanki in this uh, expansion of this uh, ring road. Chinese government, yes, they are putting money. I agree, they are putting money. But do you think like government of China is building this kind of road in their country? Do you think they are leaving this intersection like this in their country? Is there any engineer from outside going and arguing? Is this the way? Are you making the roads like this in Beijing? So we need we need that kind of capability in our, you know, like in teacher. True, true. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Bridget. We have another question from uh, the um, Please go ahead. Uh, hello, Premji. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you, please. Okay, thank you, Premji. It was a great presentation. But uh, I got a curious question here for you. And uh, sorry for that, I didn't follow the slide number, but it was related to the bicycle lane. And the presentation was like 54 minutes of this recording. And okay. while talking about the bicycle lane, you mentioned that uh, five meter in your slide. So uh, here in America, the S2 standard is the one that controls the highway and uh, transportation design. And uh, the minimum S2 requirement is uh, four feet for bicycle lane. And uh, since I'm working here in New York City, uh, the, if the street is a shared uh, use, then the minimum requirement is 10 feet. So uh, how did you get that five meter? Because that becomes more than 16 feet and that's a huge for a bicycle lane. And uh, uh, if we are talking about Nepal, then is it appropriate applying yeah, no, that? No, I, got, I, 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 I got your point. I, I got your Thank point. You. I got your point. This five meter is, uh, is very rough, just to give the space location kind of indication to the normal people, not the road engineer, you know, not the like active travel specialist like you and me who is working on this field. Actually, I'm in the design, whatever you are saying, I used to, you know, like look at the metro, like Asto and things. I know these dimensions and things, but this, I'm just giving the indication. When you have such a wide, you know, like around 75 meter, why can't we give five meter here, five meter here for the active travel? There will be the cycle, there will be the people will be walking there, there will be the electric scooter and things, you know, like here even people are challenging, why only bike? We can, you know, like share path for the electric travel kind of scenario. So that slide, I didn't, you know, I, I was not intending to give the exact dimension of that, you know, like a bicycle lane. I fully agree with the dimension that you are mentioning, but that just wanted to share about the space and location criteria, why we are neglecting this component kind of argument I was trying to do. Thank you. It's very nice. Thank, catch, you. Thank yeah. you, Premji. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. We have My second question from uh, Rajendra Sreshtaji. Thank you, um, Premji, uh, for your insightful and very relevant topic, urban transportation in Nepal. Uh, you have hit the nail right on the head. Uh, well, just like you, I have had the opportunity to work in different parts of the world. Uh, I did my postgraduate diploma in Delft, the Netherlands, and the Netherlands and Denmark are the countries where people take pride in riding bikes, bicycles, to work, to go shopping, to party, and everywhere. So, so that having the bike lanes is so important in a country like Nepal, and that's that's very relevant, right? It's it's very appropriate, and. Um, I uh, was also an expat uh, for ConocoPhillips company uh, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I used to, Malaysia itself has a very good mass transit system, metros, buses, and things like that. However, I used to travel to Singapore, and Singapore being a city state, it's got such a good mass transit, metro systems, buses, all those things. All the big apartment complexes are covered by the stops of the metro station and things like that. And there, we need to adopt their, their uh, rules and regulations because owning a vehicle, owning a car or, or SUV, things like it's it's 
very, very expensive because they uh, levy very high taxes on the uh, on vehicle ownership. So people cannot afford to have vehicles. Now in Nepal, like you said, it increased, how many times it increased in 10 years or something? 500 times, something like that. The roads are the same, but the vehicles, exactly. the number of vehicles have increased so much that, I mean, if you, if I mean, you just visited Kathmandu, it's it's uh, faster to walk than to, than to take a vehicle yeah. on the road. Yeah. But the road, it's there's so much pollution over there. There are no sidewalks in the, in Kathmandu itself. So and uh, that's 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 the problem over there. So and but if you go to Middle East, everybody can afford to have vehicle because different story, yeah, roads, things <laughs> like that. So it's totally different. And Europe, Europe has such a good mass transit system. Uh, Tokyo, man, Tokyo without the mass transit system. It, the all the vehicles will be choked on the road so so what you have brought up is is it's a very re relevant issue and we all need to think about it yeah as a diaspora for example we we thought about earthquake preparedness and uh, we gave a presentation yesterday at uh, the nepal international foundation seminar uh, it lasted for about three hours last night and uh, we are also working on the flood Preparation, Mitigation, Disaster Recovery in Nepal, which is a position paper uh, by American Society of Nepalese Engineers. And we, we are planning to publish it very soon and get it distributed all over in Nepal and here. So we as a diaspora need to think about it because, uh, and the quality control issue, that's very relevant. Exactly. There's no quality control in Nepal. Who could, because there's no expertise, the know-how, so we can do the knowledge sharing, like people like you and I can do the knowledge sharing. So they can develop their own expertise and have a say on what the contractors or the Chinese government or the Indian government can do. Now the Indian government, see, they, they like to, <laughs> to, to sell their cars, their cars, vehicles, car cars, and, and the oil and gas to Nepal. So it's in their interest to, to, to <laughs> sell more vehicles in Nepal. And we are buying that. The government of Nepal is buying the, the, that. So it's it's a huge issue, and you and I can uh, can jointly what uh, help support, share our knowledge, share our technical know-how, just like you did today, to to mitigate uh, the issue of urban transportation in Nepal. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next one is Abdul Ansari. Yes, please. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Premji for this kind of great uh, knowledge sharing uh, webinar. So uh, my question, uh, basically it's a kind of question and it's a kind of uh, curious that uh, I didn't see uh, like uh, here in, I'm living in Houston, America, and here uh, we see that uh, wherever we go to buy anything, we have to go with our, means whatever vehicle we are using, we have to we have a kind of dedicated uh, a space to park our vehicle, whether it's car or whatever is it, like that. But when we go to Nepal in Kathmandu, people are taking their, whether it's bicycle or whether it's bike or whether it's car, whatever it is, right? They are just uh, parking that car or, or, or vehicle on the road itself and they go for buy something. So I, I haven't seen a kind of a well dedicated facilities like those space uh, already allocated for park things. So do you think that can be also a kind of suggestion that they dedicate some kind of uh, a special thing like out of the, like uh, from the from the parking area, they can, the public can walk to the market by two or three minutes and from there they can buy. We, we, do you think that it can help? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Yes, that would definitely help. And, you know, to run the city, to, to run the city, we need vehicles, we need cars. We need, you know, like we need to have facilities and infrastructure to support all kind of things. This is there. But having said that, like where we need to build them, how it is impacting the network. This is very important. So if you see, I'll give you an example from Cambridge, for example. I live here in Cambridge. It's a very small city. It's, it's, it's just a university town with population of around 150,000 people. 
even in Cambridge, you cannot go. I cannot I cannot drive car to the central Cambridge. And what I do is in this minus two degrees centigrade, I'm going to pick up my wife after some time after this presentation. I will park, you know, like in the outside of the central Cambridge, there is a parking. I will park there. And even in this cold, I need to walk for another, you know, like around one kilometer. Uh, to do my things and I come back to that, you know, like car park and pick my car. So are you getting my point? So the thing is like how we are planning land use, how we are like um, giving the facilities that will also change that there is a research like infrastructure and structure that we are building around us that we are using them gradually change the behavior of people. It is quite common here for me to, you know, like uh, walk for around like, uh, you know, like one kilometer, one and a half, two kilometer to ride bicycle for another three kilometer. But in Kathmandu, the infrastructure is like this. The situation is like this. The pollution is like this. We don't want to do that. And coming to your point, yes, definitely like providing the more parking facilities will help that. But at the same time, we should not forget that like if we have more parking, more facilities related to private vehicles, that will, that will, you know, like, pull towards that if you see the modal safety you know we need to we need to if you see the principle here of the sustainable transportation we need to discourage private vehicle ownership to discourage that i'll give you an example of tokyo like uh, owning the car park is more expensive than you know like renting the apartment in some part of tokyo so what is happening like like i said earlier like if all the people who has money, if we start buying car, can we provide the car park for all those cars? No, government should impose some rules and regulation. So I agree, certainly at some part, like for example, if we talk about Kathmandu for new road, yeah, new road is a business of, everybody has to go there kind of scenario. So it's good to have some car park around there. People will go park there and go for their work. But what, what we can do, we can like make the parking charge like anything. For example, in, in some part of, I went to Nepalese Embassy, London, and, and, and the neighboring car park was charging me around 25 pounds for one hour. So I need to think, in this case, I would think twice, thrice, whether I will drive there or I'll go by train. So we need to have that kind of check and balance scenario even in Kathmandu, that would be my opinion. Yep, thank you so much. We have another question from Krishnik uh, Sreshti Ji. Hello, Namaste everyone. I'm from the UK, I know Premdi. Yeah, we are here in the UK and I'm working in national highways here. Oh, I was working near, is a, by the way, it is related to roads. So I was working in the uh, Department of Roads in, in there also. So I want to this is just add some points to help you know to understand uh, what Premz has uh, raised the many questions. Uh, he has rightly questioned about road safety and uh, the non-motorized traffic like pedestrian and uh, cycling and maybe other other event power, you know, tricycle or whatever we we call it, and the uh, metro. So I, I just wanted to have some you know highlight on public transportation system of Kathmandu or Nepal. You know, uh, traffic data shows that one third of you know all vehicle of Nepal is Register in the Bagwiti zone itself is so heavy in Kathmandu. So other things is uh, in Kathmandu is fairly is expanded, you know, growth, urban growth, uh, built up area is very high. So I'm working on that actually, yeah. And uh, I just highlight one point for public transport, which is uh, very, you know, Chaos in Kathmandu, uh, you know, the franchising system, contracting, or the the routing system or company, they all are chaos. There is a you know, I forgot the name is uh, the the uh, there, there is a you know trade trade unions, 
So they all are political. So the best example is uh, taken nowadays is London transport, uh, transport for London. So they are doing, uh, you know, uh, if you say uh, they they don't need hardly need any subsidy from the government. So a lot of you know uh, pedestrian or uh, public transport they use there in uh, London. So, but I'm relating to these two things: is public transport as underground metro also public transport? So, the public, uh, underground metro is financially impossible things if you think. Uh, in the uh, you know is uh, benefit cost ratio, it's not possible to do that. Is subsidy needed from the government or commitment from the government? So that's that's we are working on underground metro with Binuti, Dr. Binud Lala Matya. So is is two points highlighted. One is uh, like Premji said for Delhi metro. Same thing in Kathmandu. We are looking for a transport authority who can work for that. What? But there is a big but is because you know federal government and the central you know uh, what they say is the state the Bagmati uh, Pradesh is there is a two uh, fight is going between these two authorities so there are many issues but is it possible technically yeah so what I sense that the the the, about pedestrian and cycling things is the most important. The active transport is whatever you say, or sustainable transport. We have to uh, you know, push it for in Kathmandu to reduce the you know mileage of the, you know private vehicle, especially motorcycles. And the motorcycles is is hugely increased in Kathmandu. It's everywhere, and the cars. So. What I uh, was thinking of the doing, you know, two lane roads, one way. I mean, two lane, one way road. We can, you know, share with public transport and private. If 50, 50 percent, then we can reduce the, you know, the congestion. That's that's the thing I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I also have a couple of questions. Uh, first of yes, all, uh, the mobility has been always a complicated uh, system, uh, no matter what country it is. Could be Nepal, could be US, or could be the UK. It has always been a complicated uh, system. So any kind of complicated system to make it like you know, you, uh, like ease to all of the resident, all of the public is to make sure that all of the check check and balances has to be taken care of since early stages um, before it gets a mess here. So uh, in context of Nepal, like I have two questions. One is like, I know there have been lots of uh, work being done in terms of like widening roads or like there has been talks about uh, metro. Basically, basically, there has been talks about long term and short term approaches. But one one thing that I just could not fully understand is like most of the signals are unsignalized. Mainly they are operated by um, like traffic police. Manually, just by like, traffic police. Traffic police, yeah. So that could have been easily replaced by at least uh, signalized or like you know, actuated or coordinated or whatever. You know, there are many types of signals. They could have been easily replaced and. I believe, like you know, that are not that expensive um, for our municipality or not even for our country. That should have been one of the affordable solution that we, I mean, our country could have easily done. And absolutely, wondering like what's the reason behind that? You know, these kind of traffic signals are not being improved, even though they are in affordable range. And my another question is. Like since you mentioned that traffic impact study has not been implemented in probably limited or maybe there is no traffic impact study at all. So these kind of studies are very important to make sure that uh, like if there is any development or if there is a new business, or, you know, they always bring more traffic. And in order to make sure that the traffic that these businesses are bringing, make sure that it does not impact our existing road, our existing intersection. That's the whole reason behind all of these uh, traffic imp impact studies. So in context of Nepal, if you do these kind of uh, studies, 
most likely my understanding is uh, even though like all of those uh, intersections are signalized they could be level level of service services could be most likely i'm sure it could be f mm-hmm. i'm sure it is yeah. not going to be yeah. a b or c most yeah. likely it is going to be f so yeah. it is going to be difficult to convince uh, like like authority like you know to implement these kind of uh, traffic studies to be implemented especially uh, in like highly congested urban area but these these kind of studies are definitely going to be helpful for booming areas like you know suburban of capital city or suburban of like other big cities or there are many new other new cities they are developing like if these things could be implemented uh, in in place definitely it is going to be helpful but like do you think like you know these kind of studies would be still like you know helpful in highly congested areas or it's better to implement them anyway because you know once we start implementing it's going to be a part of the culture and uh, over the time like you know those signals get improved so, i mean i just wanted but, to learn your opinion but i have been saying is for example if we um well, very first thing is signalizing intersection and improving then what i think is we can significantly improve the capacity of the network by proper design of the intersections i know they will fail i i understand what you are saying you know when you put everything in synchro and run it like level of our service will come very low i agree with that but having said that to demonstrate the problem with the policy makers i have i would i would like to share my experience what I used to do is, if we need any additional land, I used to bring the Qatari when I was working in Qatar, like demonstrating him. See, look at the synchro, and I'll tell you, I used to demonstrate in the synchro, run it, and show it why I would need additional two lane in this side of the road. So, to demonstrate this to the policymaker who will not understand engineering, we need to take help from the proper, you know, like software like you know you can say synchro or citra or other software there are you know like lots of software available these days we can make use of them to demonstrate things okay it will work like this you can show the stimulation people will be happy to you know looking at the moving cars on the screen and we can show how queues are developing you know like you know how why we need such a long storage lane and why it is failing so if it is failing what to do so in that case, we can easily convince, okay, it is failing. There is nowhere. We have you know, all the you know, like houses, building and things. We cannot demolish this. So in this case, we have to go to the like mm, mass transit. So in that way, if we have, for example, if Department of Road has proper design unit, if they have proper traffic unit, if they have that kind of data and analysis, they can easily, they can easily convince politicians in our contest. They can show them, see, this is how it is not possible. It is failed. So that's the reason we have to go to the mass transit. See, this one bus is carrying 60 people and we need this car is, you know, like taking so much, 60 cars is taking so much of space here. So these tools, in my opinion, would help to demonstrate things. And secondly, if we talk about TIS, traffic impact study, I have experience because of traffic impact studies, we have asked to, you know, government has asked to cancel the development. So, for example, if Patpatan is coming in, like, for example, in, as I say, somewhere in Balaju, it is already such a crowded area. If it is coming there, once we have data, we can see this, like how much traffic is adding there. So if all the intersections are failing there, and if it, you know, like, for example, generating this much of traffic because of this development, so that will help authorities to take the decisions and whether to bring this, you know, like project here, whether this bring this development here or not. So that kind of culture, you know, once we have data, once we have system, and, and once we have a like, you know, like we follow the like methodological systems, you know, one step one, step two, this is pre-feasibility, this is feasibility, this is concept stage, and we can decide when you reach by, you know, like late feasibility or concept stage, whether this project is technically viable or not, kind of thing. So in my opinion, yes, I fully agree with you. You know, it is fully built up area and there are lots of buildings all around. We cannot wide and it's getting land and, you know, like acquiring land for the additional lanes and things to make the intersection wide. It's, it's difficult. But for example, I I, I had I was showing in another, you know, like picture in somewhere in Biratnagar to Itahari. You can definitely do there, right? So first of all, in my opinion, we should start the system proper system 
in in you know like correct system which has you know like proven that they are working kind of systems we need to establish and uh, is it follow them that would be my opinion thank you I have uh, another question from uh, Navraj Pantadai. Hello. Uh, thank you, Premji, uh, for your great presentation. And I think uh, I know you from the past. I, I think so, I work, yeah, yeah. I guess I work with each other uh, in Bagalung RIDP project. Is that correct? Yes, uh, glad, to, glad to meet you here, Panta, sir. Yeah, glad to no, meet Raji. You. It, it'll yeah, be nice yeah, to see you guys soon. <laughs> you know, for him to see also. Yeah. Excuse me. Can you please on the you know your camera so that you know Premji can see you and then yeah. know you personally? I remember we were working together in our yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm a little uh, cold <laughs> and cough and you know like high high <laughs> and just you know like taking rest at home. So anyway, uh, my question here is. Uh, you know, like uh, there is a big problem, and we discussed a lot of these problems uh, in our presentation, and other friends discuss on that. A fundamental uh, a safety issue that you know, like I was in Kathmandu last time, and before that too, I failed uh, pedestrian crossings uh, where the you know, like those zebra crossing shares. Now I see a wide speed zebra crossing all over Kathmandu. Uh, however. There is no any stop signs or road lights to stop the traffic, and people are just you know like looking on their way, the both sides of cars, and they are you know like they are running and crossing, and I was very scared you know to cross the road. Uh, everywhere I go, I find the same situation, and in fact, when I go to Kathmandu, that's my biggest problem, and in the the first. Safety issue, you know, like there are all other issues, health, but that's long term issues. But that's the instant issue if the car hits you. So, what, what do you think? Like, you know, like the, the some stop signs which is never implemented in Kathmandu may help, or some other, uh, you know, like the tools that can be used and uh, that can help, you know, like the people crossing the roads, at least from the safety point of view. Uh, that can help to some point. In in my understanding, <clears throat> like I think we need to first of all we need to like uh, signalize the major intersections. I'll give you an example. If if Chakrapath, like in Maharajganj, if if that intersection is fully signalized and Chavil is fully signalized, and they are coordinated with each other, so what will happen? How we can manage is like if you see the like in network flow. When when there is a like for example there is a traffic is coming this side and there is a rate for the this direction traffic, so all the zebra crossing in between when there is a you know like rate for that particular direction all the zebra crossing in that direction will get some acceptable gap between that rate signal and for example like they can utilize that acceptable gap and they can cross this. There are two ways. One, we can provide the push button and mid block crossing and they can just press the button and they can see and they can go and we can have a camera and enforcement and you know, like parallel if we like keep there and that will work. And then if you impose the very high, you know, like fine and, and people will follow that, you know, people will listen money, they're not listen <laughs> instruction and things. And another option, if we cannot go for the mid block crossing because we have so many crossings in Kathmandu, so many developments in either side of the road, which is very difficult. But at least in my opinion, if we can signalize major intersections, they will create a gap in between when there is a raid on that particular in our neighboring signalized intersection. And people can like that gap and they can cross. And at the same time, what I have been saying is like in case of ring road, we need to have a like median in between. So we can have a divided carriageway and we can have a median in between. So people can cross, say, like, for example, three lanes and they can get the refuse in between for some time. And when there is a, another raid is coming in the another intersection, neighboring intersections. At that time, people let get another acceptable gap. I'm not sure whether I'm able to explain this or not. And, and in, no, in no, that no, way, no. we can manage. In that way, I think we can manage. You know, like a uh, pedestrian crossing in between major intersections. 
So other small intersections, they are not carrying that much traffic. They can be just in and out, you know, in our case, it can be left in, late out, left out type of, you know, like intersections. They're not carrying that much traffic. So they will not, you know, they will give acceptable gaps. But at least if we can control like, you know, main flow for like say 120 seconds or so, it will give some acceptable gap throughout the downstream side and, you know, people can cross in that area. That would be my opinion. Yeah, that could be helpful. We are yeah. running out of time, and uh, I think there is one more question from Rajendra Sester. That probably this is going to be our last questions uh, before we wrap it up. And I do not think that I don't think that we can take any more questions after that. Okay, uh, you might have already heard about it. Uh, just to bring it to your attention, that uh, Indonesia is planning to relocate its uh, capital from Jakarta to. Nusantara in East Kalimantan to reduce the traffic congestion because uh, traffic congestion in Jakarta is very bad. Expats are not allowed to drive cars. Uh, they're given with drivers. So it's, it's very bad in Jakarta. So for that reason, they are trying to, they are planning to relocate its capital itself to East Kalimantan. Let's think about it too. Thank you. Thank you. I have nothing I, to say on this point. We are talking about bringing uh, capital to Chita. I'm sorry, uh, I just wanted to that, that but... uh, Anil Chaudhuryji has been trying to uh, ask a question for a very long time. For some reason, he was at the bottom of the list. I wasn't see it. Uh, please, Anilji, your question is going to be last one. Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, and this is indeed <clears throat> a very uh, great conversation. And thank you, Prenji, such an insightful discussion on transportation. My name is Anil Chaudhary, and I have been working for <coughs> Texas Department of Transportation for over five years now. I recently switched from that field, but but having worked for over five years, and particularly in planning for a couple of years, I have quite a couple of points to uh, ask you, or maybe discuss. I know we are running out of time, but still, I'm trying to keep it short. So That's we know we have like a lot of resources all the guidelines and then, you know, policies available, no matter where we come from, what part of the world we are in, right? You talked about high, highway capacity manual, yeah, yeah. design guidelines, roadside design guidelines. We have everything and we have been using yeah, it for so many years to design highway across the globe. So now my question is, how are we doing in Nepal? Are we planning it properly? Is there a way that we can kind of like um, inform our policymakers that, hey, we are running behind, we need to catch up. So is there a way established that knowledge sharing can be made very efficient and easy? Because we know we, we have resources, guidelines and everything. All we need is a proper channel to establish it into the policy and getting it implemented. So. How are we doing on that? Since you have brought context of Nepal, is there anything that we we can work on, or is there anything established already where we can add some some efforts? If you thank you for the question, it's very nice questions. Like, excuse me, I'll just I'll just receive one form and I'll just. Sorry. So in, in my understanding, we have Nepal road standard, but but it is not very comprehensive and there are lots of you know gaps on it. So in my opinion, we need to have clear, you know, like design manual for people to follow it. And if you see in Nepalese concept, like after going on this federalization, we have this local government and they are also building road, we have provisional government government, they are pro provisional government, they are also building roads and there is a central government department of roads. So they are also, you know, like doing all this. So what is happening, there is a kind of confusion, as you said. So in my opinion, there should be the clear guidelines. Actually, I have this point in one of the recommendations. I have, you know, even listed out the things to be included in the Nepal road standard. 
So I didn't you know, get a chance to explain these things because of, you know, we're running out of time. So definitely we need to have very clear and comprehensive design manual in the context of Nepal. We can get the help from, you know, like for example, DMRV, if you talk about UK or us, if we talk about United Kingdom, you know, like um, US, but we can we can take help from the manual developed in the developed countries, but we need to bring them to in our context. For example, if somebody is building road in Dhangadi and somebody is doing in the Japa, this would be like some standards to follow. And and I have been saying this clear, you know, like uh, road clarity, you know, like functional classification of the road. For example, like is ring road uh, like expressway? No. Is this major arterial? Maybe yes. Is it collector? Could be kind of scenario there. We don't have clear, you know, like functional classification of road. So what I'm saying is we should have clear, you know, like standard to follow, classification to follow, and definition, and you know, kind of things we can, and 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 accordingly we can, you know, like depending on the design speed and things we can, you know, give the detailed manual for the different kind of geometric design parameters. So yes, I agree with you. There are, you know, like there is no clear guidelines to follow. And, and, and I think, I think we can support, to be honest, from diaspora, we have a massive diaspora by now. There are lots of Nepalese engineers working abroad in developing countries, like you and me serving, you know, like doing projects in the developed countries and, and you know, like gaining and gathering lots of knowledge. And, and, and definitely, I also know that we would love to, we would love to contribute to our motherland. But what is happening here, the people who are sitting there, to be honest, they should be interested to receive this, you know, like skill and knowledge in their part. I am, I do respect to all, you know, like all the individuals working there. I don't want to go in the particular in the engineering community because, you know, like we all know there are political instability and things. Nobody has a like ownership of the states and, you know, like there are lots of other, you know, like issues. So probably that could be the reason, but yes, we can contribute and we have that capability. We can do, you know, like, but this receiving part is, you know, like not interested to be, you know, bold and clear. Hope I answered my question. I don't know, maybe, you know. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Thank you. That was very nice. Um, But but only one thing that, that I uh, wanted to point out that there is always a plan um, which uh, needs to be implemented and uh, executed to reach to a certain point of goal, right? For example, Texas has 10 years of unified transportation plan, UTP we call it. And we have everything set up, a proper planned out for next 10 years where we wanna be, what we wanna do, established and working Texas, Techstart we call it, Texas Department of Transportation is working hard to achieve that goal, right? So my regard uh, concern here is, do we even have a plan established, something like this, or any, any different, where we want to be in the next 10 years or five years? Has Department of Roads, Nepal, has considered any anything like that, or, or no, not yet? There is. There are there are no clear uh, master plan. If you talk about you know like um, like for the different horizon year, what we want after ten years, what you want after twenty years, what you want after thirty years, say fifty years, that kind of planning is not there. There are some planning going on, but they are you know within this within you know like in particular stakeholders are doing something, but they are not well coordinated in between. That kind of scenario I have seen there. Uh, if you talk about outside, you know, like uh, in, in other countries, I was working in Qatar and I was working for the like 2050 Qatari master plan for the, you know, like old Qatar. So that kind of, I fully agree with you, like, you know, like uh, normally like this kind of, you know, like development and plan and master planning things happen and and, and, and we, we all follow the those plans and, and those goals. But in our countries, there are things, but, you know, like they are not coordinated well in between. Can I can I add something, Ramji, from, from the Nepal perspective? Please. So yeah. So Department of Roads, I worked there, and there was a twenty years plan. I worked there for ten years, five years, three years. So there was a planning concept there. There's nothing that uh, we do not plan. You know, we plan there. But what happened is nowadays I check the 
plan, policy, and strategy, everything I check. And when you go to this year plans, next year plans, they, they are not synchronized, you know. The yeah, concept exactly. strategy is fully they have spoken strategy, transport said there is a metro, there is a pedestrian, there is a recognized uh, in the plan, in the plan uh, annual plan. So that's the issue, you know. The issue so of control by the uh, we are getting an echo from somewhere. I don't know if someone can mute, probably uh... I think I yeah, yeah, we are we are hearing you, sir, Krishna, sir. Uh, yeah. So, so let's say uh, the concept of uh, ring road. If you take the Chinese, uh, you know, built up road, everything they have done, but they missed the point that they they didn't do the intersection point, they didn't do the NMT thing, they, the how the road is crossed, and everything is uh, left for the uh, Department of Roads. And Department of Roads okay. is not planning there. They have done nothing. So, although I was there, but but I was uh, intervening, like, uh, you know, I rejected the consultants when I was from DOR. The first task I've given was Dodara Chandani. You, you might know the uh, Mahakali River uh, at the uh, you know, Indian border. So two village, villages, village, uh, com uh, you know, committee is, is the Gambika Samiti is, uh, west of the Mahakali River. So there was a there was a proposal to be made for the crossing. This is 1.4 kilometer. So someone from our uh, you know consultant, I do not name it. So they, they given two options. One is uh, you know cable car and another is multiple you know uh, suspension bridge. So multiple suspension bridge uh, is I have not seen multiple suspension bridge there are two uh, two span bridge or three span, but I have not seen multi -span, uh, multiple suspension bridge is working. So I ask how you work. There. So see if you load one span, another load will be affected. If it is the same, uh, you know, cable is going through. So I rejected both of them is uh, and then uh, work for another uh, option. So lastly, uh, I I have created a uh, multiple span, but you know, a single, a single, uh, like a suspension bridge. Four suspension bridge we connected with simple solution. Now it is uh, yeah, standing. Yeah. I, I, I agree with your point, sir. Like, see, oh, so actually, I, have, I think, uh, I think we are running out of time. I think we we have already uh, passed significant amount of time. Yeah. yeah. We have Maybe I know this kind of discussion. I, I mean, from, uh, from as a uh, as a community of American society of. Uh, Bridge engineers, we can have multiple uh, events in future. We would definitely love to have this kind of discussion in the future. And for, due to the time constraint, I would like to uh, wrap up uh, our question and answer session. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Prem Ramsalju, for all of your all of your effort and this beautiful presentation with lots of thoughts. And meanwhile, on behalf of Greater Houston um, Chapter of American Society of Nepalese Engineers, I would like to extend our thanks to you. And meanwhile, I would also like to extend uh, thanks to, on behalf of all of the attendees that we have in this webinar. And <clears throat> as a, at the Houston Chapter, as well as American Society of Engin uh, Nepalese Engineers, we are, we are dedicated to, you know, provide at least one program every month. And we're also dedicated to, you know, to provide all of these uh, webinars and all of these kind of like, like talk programs so that we can share our knowledge to each other. And I would really appreciate if, uh, your participation in coming futures. And <clears throat> before I wrap it up, I would, I, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Priyan Ramsadzuin. I really would like to uh, thank you so much for all of these presentation and all of these knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing. And I would like to wish everyone a very wonderful day. And meanwhile, if any one of you would like to receive any kind of like uh, one, uh, PDS, please uh, reach me out. I will provide you a certificate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.